Good morning, Grand Fork Central Field Biology. After looking through or scanning through, I guess, some of your um, rankings of topics, uh, looks like constellations and mythology was one of the highly clicked on or highly chosen ones. And uh, I'm kind of excited about this. I haven't taught constellations for several years. Uh, we just kind of got away from it for whatever reason, and this is actually one of my biggest interests. So uh, this should be fun. It's something that really we have all the lab equipment at our disposal. It's out in the sky, and we can all pretty much see the sky. So uh, let's get into this here. All right, first off, um, I guess what, one reason this is so important to me besides the fact that I do like stars and I've always had an interest in in stars and things is my star teacher the person that I learned constellations from um, was actually named Eileen Starr from Valley City State University and this is her book I tried to scan it in lost the color I did something wrong but you can see the book that she wrote. She wrote this about 10 years ago. And it's called Star Myths of Northern Cultures. And if you read the text around that circle, it said Northern peoples saw the same sky. Interpretation depended on their environment and their beliefs. So whether they were Norse or Greek or Native American, they all had a similar view, but their interpretation of that view depended on their culture. She was probably the best teacher I ever had. She was awesome. Tried to scan this in too and maybe it got a little, little grainy, but I will read it to you out loud. People of long ago understood the world as a small area of land, sometimes bordered by hills or by the sea. They observed the sky and saw the sun moon, and innumerable stars. Early observers projected their concern and a sense of identity with the local environment into the sun, moon, and star patterns. The sky became the home of supernatural beings and objects, which became the basis of their astronomical mythology. This mythology influenced their subsequent folklore cultures and customs. Every culture has been awed by this celestial spectacle. The explanation of what they saw was woven into the culture's oral history. Exact time schedules were not needed until animal migrations or agriculture became important. People then related their earthly pursuits to the movements of the sun, moon, and stars. Later it became useful to record astronomical events, such as eclipses, to predict when they would occur again. Observation, recognition, and prediction form a sequence in any culture's attempts to understand their environment. The sky is a common heritage for all of us. We still share the same sense of wonder. And when I read that um, this weekend, looking at her book, uh, in this time where we've had uh, a pandemic and you know we're connected to all parts of the world and we know people are traveling here and there and sending information here and there. It's kind of humbling to know that at one point our ancestors, their view of the world was a lot smaller. I think that's kind of a, kind of a nice uh, thing to learn about right now. All right, before we can talk about constellations, a couple of uh, things that we need to understand. Light pollution. I know we talk about water pollution and air pollution and things like that, but there's also something called light pollution. And it's not dangerous, but what it does is it blocks our view of the stars. So we can see there a uh, urban environment, uh, a city perhaps, or a suburb. And with the street lights, car headlights, things like that, um, our eyes, you know, can only take so much light so when those lights are on in a very bright way 
uh, we can't see the stars, but if we were to get rid of that artificial light, then we're able to see the stars of the sky a lot better. It's just like daytime, right? Our sun is a star. So in the daytime, our stars aren't gone. It's just there's one real close one that kind of trumps everything else that we can see. And it could depend on where you live. You know, I'm a maps uh, lover, as I've talked to you before. So you can see here, depending on where you live, you know, if we uh, say Chicago, if you live in inner, inner city Chicago, it might be tough to see stars. Lost my cursor. There it is. Minneapolis. If I'm correct, that should be Fargo. That'd be Grand Forks, pretty sure. Lost my cursor again. Winnipeg's up there. Okay. So I could look at this all day. I got to move on. I only have 15 minutes. I can get lost in a map pretty fast. All right. Another thing we need to establish is the fact that our Earth spins on an axis. The Earth is tilted at about 23 and a half degrees, and our north axis points directly at what we call the North Star. And so, if you've heard of the North Star, you've all heard of Polaris, and people sometimes call me that incorrectly. Um, the snowmobile company was named after this North Star. And that's crucial for us uh, not only navigating, and our ancestors used this in their navigation, but also in getting a sense of you know where, where the constellations are at. And because our Earth spins on its axis, um, Throughout the night, our constellations appear to move. Now, of course, they're not moving. We're the ones moving. But this is a time-lapse photograph showing that movement. We really can't make out much here except for circles of, of light. But right here, this would be your North Star. So the North Star really doesn't appear to move because our axis is pointed directly at it. It's kind of cool. I always get a. I always like looking at these pictures that people take. All right, so today we're going to talk about the circumpolar constellations, and these are the ones that we see all year. And the reason they call them circumpolar is uh, because of their location uh, in terms of the point of our axis. Uh, at least if you're in a northern hemisphere, which we are, uh, we can see these all year round. So our first one is called Ursa Major. And if we break that down, Ursa is the genus name of the bears. And Major means big. So this translates in English into Great Bear. And these other names are their Greek names. Okay, and we use Greek. Um, bases in, in science. In other areas too, so Ursa Major, Great Bear, and you all know the Big Dipper, and the Big Dipper is not really the Great Bear, but the Big Dipper is part of the Great Bear, and we can see the Big Dipper is kind of the hindquarters and tail of that bear. Okay, and you might think that tail is a little long for a bear, and that's true, um, as you guys get into the mythology, we will see explanations for that. And this is the key constellation of the circumpolar constellations, because everyone can find the Big Dipper. Okay, so the key is you find the Big Dipper first. And then from the Big Dipper, we can get the Little Dipper, which is part of Ursa Minor, which of course means the Little Bear. And this is where Polaris or the North Star is. It's what we call a guidepost star. So a guidepost star for any constellation is a star that 
might be a higher magnitude or higher brightness or it's easy to find and that helps us to kind of navigate through the sky um, remember there's no lines up in the sky you know artists draw them in as we saw here you know does that look like a bear well that looks like a bear does that look like a bear eh, yeah. okay imagination right so uh, they are not connected we have to connect them in our in our mind so how do you find the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper? Very easy. So find the Big Dipper, which everyone can. Little Dipper is a little harder to see. It's a little more um, faint in brightness, but the two end stars of the cup of the Big Dipper, or the ladle, we call those the pointer stars. And what you do is you follow that line continually, and the distance between those about five times that distance. So one, two, three, four, five, and we get to Polaris, the North Star, and that's the end of the handle of the dipper. Okay. Now, many people are surprised that the North Star isn't super, super bright. Okay, it's really kind of a medium brightness star. Okay, it's not that, um, it's not that, breathtaking when you see it by itself but this will always point north and so if you were lost at night you could find your direction and the two dippers dump into each other so they pour into each other you can imagine if there is soup or a liquid in here I could pour it in here and pour it in here seasonally because the North Star doesn't move but everything else does and uh, or, or appear to move and our earth also goes around the sun uh, we get a seasonal difference in the dippers so in the summer we get it where the handle goes up and uh, spring winter and fall and so I remember Dr. Starr used to tell us summer we think of things growing spring we think of rain falling fall we think of a basket of leaves in winter, we think of an icicle drooping. Pretty clever. All right, we also have Draco the dragon. And Draco actually is between the dippers. And the tail of the dragon is between there. And this one's kind of a tough one to find sometimes. It's a large, I mean, the big dipper itself is big. So this is a huge constellation. Sometimes that's tough when we see a picture and then we try to translate it to the sky. And then our other two circumpolar constellations are the king and the queen of Ethiopia. And as we get into the mythology, you guys will investigate that. But uh, Cepheus, the king, and Cassiopeia, the queen, and they are next to each other, as they should be, king and queen. They are on the other side of Polaris, or the North Star, from the Big Dipper. So if you can find the Big Dipper, and you can follow it, you can find the North Star and the Little Dipper here, as we can see. On the other side of that, we should see a house shape, which is Cepheus the King, and a W or M shape, depending on what time and what time of year it is. Uh, it could also be upside down as an M. And there they are all together. Okay, I've got one minute left of recording time, so um, I will also tell you that uh, on when, no, oh, Thursday, sorry, at Thursday we will Zoom during our class time, and that's a time for you to check in and say hello and maybe ask some questions or, or whatnot. Uh, in addition, today there will be a website I want you guys to read and an exit ticket to fill out. Next week, we'll get further into the mythology component of this stuff. Um, what I would like you guys to do before Thursday, and this is totally dependent on cloud cover, uh, try to get outside, see if you can find all five of these circumpolar constellations. And then maybe we can talk about that on Thursday and maybe set up a virtual lab or something. Okay, I got eight more seconds. I'm going to click off. We will see you later.